Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. In honor of the 150th birthday of the early 20th century American author Willa Cather, I'm reading a variety of biographies and literary criticism about her work, as well as buddy reading several of her novels. Today, I have the very special pleasure of sharing a wonderful conversation I had with the amazing Kim of Middle of the Book March of Cather's novel, O Pioneers. I'll leave a link to Kim's channel down below in the show notes. Before we get started, I want to say that sometimes in Cather's books, she more or less lays out right in the beginning where things are going to stand at the end, and we follow her stories to see how that transformation happens. That is not true in O Pioneers. At the very start of the book, we see where things are heading, but some events are not necessarily foreseeable. And Kim and I don't want to spoil those developments for readers who might want to experience them fresh for themselves. I do think we're going to talk about those events, but we'll hold back on spoilers until the end of the conversation and let you know when the spoiler-free portion of the discussion is coming to a close. Let's go on to our conversation. Welcome, Kim. I'm so glad you could come today. And I'm looking forward to talking about O Pioneers with you by Willa Cather. Thank you, Hannah. It's it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm glad we got the chance to read this book together. Oh, it was wonderful. Um, well, I wanted to just give a very brief summation of what's going on when the book starts and then ask you a little bit about your reactions. Sure. So um, the main character is Alexandra, and she's a Swedish immigrant to Nebraska, and she's strong and smart. Her father tells her that when he dies, that she will be in charge of the family's finances, um, taking care of the land. The family doesn't all feel totally comfortable with that all the time. Right. Um, but she's um, he considers her wise and imaginative as well right um, do you know the time period that this is set in because I was trying to get a, a good sense of that and I wasn't really sure and the whole time I was reading um especially Alexandra's character I'm like what is the what is the year what w when did this book start because the way the way Mr. Bergstrom treated her was unheard of with a daughter because he had three sons so it, it would have been assumed that any land or property or uh, financial resources would have been inherited by a son even though she was the oldest so I thought that was really interesting to start the story and it was also pretty clear even when um, you know she was 15 and Emil was five and she kind of you know, took care of him and he's crying because the, the kitten got stuck up the pole. But she you could tell she was independent and strong and kind of knew what she was doing. So it Cather set the tone immediately for Alexandra to be that very strong primary character. I think the story takes place in the very end of the 19th century. Um, yeah, that and it's makes not sense written until a, a bit later, but I'm pretty right. sure that, um, that that would have been highly unusual for- Yes, uh, definitely. Was... But I was really impressed by Mr. Bergson because he could see his daughter's potential and he could see her, her business sense and her strength. And he made a very good, he made a very wise decision because he also could see what was lacking in his sons, his older sons. And it must have been hard for for men at the young men at the time to respond to that, given how unusual it was. Right. And I think they were resentful about that. And, you know, even when everybody was much younger and they were still they were working as farmhands, basically. But I, I think I, you know, you could read especially when he's dying and he's informing everybody what his plans are. His his two older sons were, you know, reluctant to accept his his dying wishes, but they knew they had to. Right. I think it's very interesting, not only her role in within the ha home, within her family, but 
her role as the female pioneer here, um, that the, the pioneer is actually a pioneer by being right. a woman and and that um, she's, uh, there's a critic, I actually wrote down the quote and I'm trying to find it. Yeah, the story of a nation building in a female key. And so the story of her as an independent person, but also sort of as the face of the new America. Um, right. To be what Catherine right. is kind of drawing here. I thought she she was a visionary. And mm -hmm. I, I guess I guess in a way that's what a pioneer has to be. And she saw the things that were going to work, even though nobody thought her ideas were any good. And her own brothers were looking at her like, you don't know what you're doing. You're going to you're going to drive this land into the ground, so to speak. You're going to fail. And she just, you know, kind of patiently waited them out and did what she knew what was right anyway and was a great success. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in addition to being strong, she um, is reserved in her mm -hmm. emotional state. Um, right. She has what's kind of a sweetheart in Carl. Um, right. What did you think of Carl? He's kind of an interesting pairing with her strength. He's a much more um, controlled and shy. Yeah. Artistic, did, sensitive. Yeah. Yeah, sensitive and shy. And he, to me, he, he appears as a helper. And he's almost part of the family, because they're always, everybody's always together. But he was a helper. And it was pretty obvious early on in the book that he had feelings for her. But at, at that age, you know, you've got so many insecurities. And he, he's he was a boy so of course he thought he had to make his way in the world before he could offer anything to a young woman and i think that was you could kind of read between the lines in the very beginning of the book that that's where they were at right. and i thought he was sweet and reserved um and it you know they had that regard for each other but as you said, Alexandra's quite reserved as well. And I think for me that um, not put me off of her in the very beginning, but I connect very emotionally to characters and she's she's um, proper, but not in a prissy way. She is a woman of her time. She's patient. She's she's smart and wise at the same time even very young um but she she doesn't reveal very much emotionally she's not an open person and that's i think in a way that's graceful of her even though for me i usually connect on a deeper emotional level to a character and i think we see some of that throughout the book for me uh, right there are a, a variety of moments where things happen and i expect one sort of emotional response yes. it's not... yeah it's true it doesn't wait a minute. why didn't that she didn't feel that way that didn't happen yeah so carl despite their um close friendship and goes to the big city to try to start a new life um, right. and then later goes to alaska um and he knows that, as he says, that Alexandra belongs to the land. That right. She, you know, that Nebraska is her home. Um, right. And that it's not just Nebraska, the state. It's it's her land. Um, yeah. She's a part of, she's almost a part of the soil. It's, it's, it's physical for her. Yeah. And she's not a person that could leave it. And she's not a person that could be pulled off of the land it's not just an inheritance for her i think it's it's part of her essence and he i think it, he smartly can see that and um that i think that's one of one of cather's biggest strengths is writing a type of a character who is that connected to the land and yes. to the setting and the atmosphere she does that so well in her books I'm not um, 
a literary scholar by any means, but from what I was reading, that idea of a novel of the land or or having the land be the character, as people yeah. often say, um, was relatively new in literature right. when Catherine was doing it. Um, right. It's and it's study. interesting because she was not born in Nebraska. She's from Virginia and her family moved to Nebraska when she was nine years old. But the way she can write about the prairie and the plains and the the west and the southwest, uh, the mid, the midwest of the country, you would think that she was born into it as well, but she wasn't. So I, I, mm -hmm. I found that pretty striking. Well, let's go back for a second. Um, how, what's been your experience with Cather so far? You've read more than, this isn't your first Cather, is it? No, um, I read The Lost Lady. I think that's the one, The Lost mm -hmm. Lady. And um, Death Comes to the Archbishop, which is 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 magnificent in Cather's use of setting as a character. And the uh, she's writing about the Southwest and this priest and it, it's not anything that's plot heavy but it's so beautiful in the way she writes about the land and she writes about the desert and the people um so i don't know if you've read that book but i still have it oh um, i think i think that's one you have to pick up i think you would love that one um i read the professor's house i just just yes. finished it and, and there's definitely some similarities i gather with the setting right. but i'm looking forward to right the death comes to the archbishop well this book o pioneers is her second novel or her first if you listen to her she always I, yeah. um, said it was her second first novel right right and i thought that's that was it's a pretty good um second debut i guess mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. That's what I thought about it. I, I mean, she's clearly thought of it as her her first because it was so different from her right. first, from her actual first. And right. She's really this is her first novel about the West. Yes. The broad broadly speaking West, which right. Yeah. Well, so in addition to all of this uh strength of the land of her connection with the land and um her support of the family, there are actually a lot of struggles and tension in this book, yes. the tensions between the siblings that we've talked about, but also, yeah. you know, financial hardships. Yeah. Are there things about that that you found useful in understanding her experience? I think this, uh, one of the strongest things about her is her resilience and tenacity. Um, she's not tenacious in a in a in a stubborn aggressive way she just knows herself and she's going to stick with the project because I, she had an inner confidence that what she planned on was going to work and it clearly did because she was the one that that achieved not just financial success but um a security with this this inheritance and it prospered because of her but she never she never became arrogant with it even though her her older brothers her the two oldest brothers were so condemning of her and so skeptical of what she was planning and i think even at one point she was afraid that they would try to take it from her and yeah. um she was the one that that built it and she built a legacy for the whole family. And I thought that was um, so resilient, but so forward thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, she had her, in, her she confidence. Had insight. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I don't know. You know, I can't explain to you why this is the way it's going to be, but it is. <laughs> right. She was just sure of it. Right. Yeah. And I think that con it confirmed it for me when we get later in the book and um, she makes a comment about, or Cather had written a comment about, she chose to plant alfalfa and everybody at the time thought she was crazy, but that's what brought them lasting wealth is her choices of what to plant. Instead of planting corn, we're going to plant wheat and alfalfa and the land prospered, but that you have to be very forward thinking and, and think of the big picture in order to make those decisions and stick with it. Well, 
in addition to the hardships that she's able to overcome, the financial troubles in the area at various points, um, there are some symbolic tensions in the book. Um, I'm thinking specifically of, of the presence of wild ducks throughout. Um, right. And there's a disturbing scene um, in the earlier part of the book um, Alexandra's younger brother has a crush on a Czech immigrant um, and um, they go out hunting and he shoots wild birds, which she is interested in hunting with him. Um, but when she sees the dead bird, she's really upset um, right. because they've been having fun is what she says, essentially, yeah. um, that they're having fun and you made them stop having fun. And right. they've been wild and free and and that it's she's very hurt by that um right and we see that recurring a lot in the book um one of the characters that i find most intriguing in this is ivar i'm not sure how to pronounce his name right um, but he um is very upset about the killing of the birds he thinks of them almost as sacred and um even when he sees the brothers standing out on under the sky filled with birds he says no guns no guns and he's right he's, um, worried about this i wasn't i'm not going to spoil anything but the scene with emil and marie and the duck shooting i think there's a lot of foreshadowing there yes indeed that's all yes. i'm gonna say <laughs> yes and we'll, let's get to that in, in a little while um <laughs> So it's Ivar is a really interesting character. Um, he's an elderly man who has relatively unconventional ideas, personal ideas as well as religious ideas. Um, he goes barefoot all the time. Um, he has spells. It's unclear what the spells are, right. but a lot of he's afraid he's going to be put into an asylum, and um, the brothers are afraid that he might. Um, hurt their sister right um but he cares about alexandra and alexandra mm -hmm. cares about him there's actually a place where one character asks him why he goes barefoot right um where he says um that from his youth he's had a strong rebellious body subject to every kind of temptation but that he believes from his reading of the Bible that um, his feet are free, that feet in general are free members. And right. that he can let them go free. He can tromp around in the mud. He can do yeah. anything to, um, in the filth when his desires are low. He can, um, and I think that fear of temptation yeah. is important in the end of the book. Right, I agree. This might be the the time to talk about um, that plot line that right. uh, some people might see as spoilers. Yeah, in here and Catherine treats it in kind of a subtle way, and and I really think that the point of that plot line is about the development of the major theme. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. it's it's a for people who don't want spoilers. This might be a time to right um, take a little break yeah <laughs> spoiler territory yes. um, you know when you were talking about Ivar when he was talking about his feet and trying to explain to somebody why he goes barefoot all the time to him it's you know he says the bible never says anything about feet when it comes to the the parts of the body that can lead a person into temptation it's that that theme of temptation and and all of his lecturing about temptation and, uh, you know, the spoiler part is, you know, we meet Emil when he's five years old in the very beginning of the book. And and we see him through Alexandra's eyes. We see him as this lovely little boy, you know, typical little boy, but sweet and smart and sensitive. And we're I don't I wasn't expecting to watch his growth arc. I wasn't expecting that, you know, he was I thought he was going to grow into being another farm boy and live on the land and with the rest of his siblings i wasn't expecting that 
he was kind of the favorite of Alexandra and the favorite, the baby of the family. So she wanted something different for him. And so she encouraged him to go away, go to college, see the world. And he does come back, but all of a sudden he comes back as a man, as a young man. And there's where we see his path down temptation when he starts to fall for Marie, who's married. And of course, she's a young, newly married, effervescent, um, gregarious young woman. And we see the mismatch between her and her husband, Frank. It's, it's a clear mismatch in temperament, if not everything else. But then we see the connection between Emil and Marie and you know, the duck hunting and the shooting of the duck and um, her being upset by that. But we, we see the connection throughout the middle of the book as it gets to the climax of we we see separately the the snippets of Frank's anger and his bitterness and some jealousy. Um, and of course, Emil and Marie are sensing their growing attraction, love or lust for each other. And Emil decides the way to escape this is I have to leave. I have to get out of here. And he goes to say goodbye, that one last goodbye. And he finds her on the edge of the orchard. And you're right when you say Cather treats this very respectfully and she doesn't reveal too much, but it's very clear what she's telling the reader. She's very clear that they're lovers or they would have been even in a deeper romantic emotional way, but she handles it so well and reservedly. And then of course, Frank shoots them both as he's looking through the hedge. Do we believe that he knew what he was doing? Do we believe his reaction that he didn't realize he was killing his wife and he didn't want to kill this young boy, but he did and he flees. Um, and that was such a climactic moment but it's it's wrapped up in that temptation and all, all the temptation that Ivar is speaking of, the temptation of the body and the temptation of the flesh. And what I thought was so striking is Alexandra's reaction after Emil dies. Yeah. How did you react to that? What she does is she goes to the prison and she visits Frank, the husband. Right. Um, and she offers him her forgiveness. Um, yeah. I was not I, expecting that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is this is her baby. Emil was her baby. And she brought him up after their parents died. And I thought she I thought she would automatically be profoundly angry at Frank for what he did. And that that in the moment decision but she told him that she feels more for him than she does for Emil and Marie because they were in the wrong they succumbed to the temptation and I thought that was so that was very striking because I would not have personally felt that way and I could feel myself wait a minute what are you doing this doesn't make any sense to me um, yeah. And I just kept thinking she's a bigger woman than me because I don't think I would have reacted that way. Yeah. One of the critics um, that I was reading um, said that this is this moment of grace when she right. gives the forgiveness. Do you think it is grace? Do you? I do think it's grace in a way, but when if we're looking at a religious symbolism for grace grace is unmerited and we don't deserve it when we receive grace but for her she feels frank deserves it and she's right. she's giving deserved grace and she has mercy on him and i i can it was so strong to me that sense of sincerity like she wasn't just doing it to make herself right. feel better she truly believed that he deserved forgiveness yeah twice you've said that you were surprised that something happened <laughs> um one is how Emil grew up right but it's it's also really interesting to me that even in that first few that first scene where he's five-year-old crying about his kitty right he then goes into the drugstore and who does he meet but Marie as a little little right. girl 
and she's totally flirting with him. So we yeah. see it's all and Carl is there too. And so, you know, we're seeing the beginnings of exactly what plays out. Right. The novel. Right. I know another little another little bit of foreshadowing, you know. Who who would have known? Who knew? Right. right. The flirtatious <laughs> girls. Yes. Be the adulterous liaison later I on. I know. I don't think she could help it though, because of just her personality and her temperament. She was clearly that way, even as a little girl. She was just full of life and and you know, extroverted and happy and joyful with these little things. And I I don't think she could help it in a way yeah. yeah and she was the the wild duck right I mean she right. was the free and having fun and right yeah right so after that uh Carl reappears and they decide to get married and what Alexandra says is I think when friends marry, they're safe. We don't suffer like these young ones. Yeah. Their relationship is not the passionate relationship that right. her younger brother had with Marie. It's this very loving but passionless. Um, and I, I think that word safe, this the yeah, that's, so much into that hit exactly me. the temptation that they were talking about. Um, yeah. Yeah, that hit me the same way as well. I thought, well, do would I have wanted a safe relationship? But right. then I remember maybe myself, especially after what happened. Right. Uh, although I think right. she it was her personality as well. Yeah. But, but I think, you know, at, at her stage in life, her personality, um, there's a deeper love beyond passion and beyond, you know, infatuation. And maybe she thought that she got to skip over all of that in favor of something deeper and, and more meaningful to her. You know, that's not what all of us would choose. That's not what all of us think when we think of married love. But for her, I think safe is a good thing. Even though, you know, to us, to like the modern reader, safe is kind of like boring. <laughs> so, but I don't think she, I don't think she saw any of that as boring. I think she saw that as this is what her life was meant to come to. And that gave her such a sense of peace and contentment. So would you call it a happy ending? I think I would. As a reader. Yeah, I think I would. And I especially liked Carl's reaction to her because he he softly kissed her on the lips and he kissed her eyes and he was holding her hand. And to me, that's a happy ending. I wasn't expecting a grand finale. I wasn't, you know, I was I was very happy that she didn't go off with him and go back with him. I thought, okay, that is so I would have hated the book had she decided to leave and go with him and I'm so glad she didn't so to me that was a happy ending <laughs> and quite honestly the very the very last I don't know how many sentences it is the very last I think it's one long sentence of the book is my probably my favorite passage in the whole book and I'm gonna I'm gonna read it um she tells him I've been very lonely Carl and she's leaning on his shoulder and she says, I'm tired. And then it says, they went into the house together, leaving the divide behind them under the evening star. Fortunate country that is one day to receive hearts like Alexandra's into its bosom, to give them out again in the yellow wheat, in the rustling corn, in the shining eyes of youth. And I thought that it was so beautiful. And when it talks about hearts like Alexandra's, I think I think that was the one line in the entire book where I could read into her passion. She has an internal passion and she knows herself. I think that was the important thing. And I just love that last sentence of the book. It is beautiful. Yeah. I, I think there's so many times where I've come across a phrase that I yeah. didn't necessarily think meant a whole lot sometimes even, right. but which was just so so lovely right I agree very simple and plain and yeah yep. just stunning um, yeah 
some of my favorite books are that way. Simple, plain, but beautiful language. So was this a book that would make it onto your some of your favorite books list? I'm giving this, I would probably give this like a four and a half. Um, a five-star book for me, I have a very deep emotional connection to. And I, I love the book. I thought it was beautifully written. Cather's way of writing setting and landscape is just gorgeous. But there was a little bit of emotional piece missing for me. But I, I do love the book. And I would I will definitely continue to read the trilogy. Um, and I've only heard great things about the next two books. And, and my Antonia, I think, is the one that she is, is lauded so much for, so highly praised for. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's wonderful. And there are a lot of interesting parallels. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's my favorite. Yeah. What did you, awesome. overall, what did you think about this one? You've been asking I me a lot of questions. It. I loved it. And I had read it before and I liked yeah. it more this time than I did the first time, but um, I didn't love it as much as my Antonia. Right. Okay. Now that's making me even more eager to get to it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having this discussion with me today. This was uh, of course. I'm glad we were mm -hmm. able to do it. Sounds thank good. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you.